Our text this morning is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, a very familiar passage, especially on Communion Sunday, beginning with uh, verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. Let us pray. Gracious Father, as we look at this text and as we think of the meaning of the communion table, pray that you would quiet our hearts, that we might hear your Holy Spirit speaking to us personally, and that we might make, might, might make any application to our lives that is necessary. And so we ask your blessing now, in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. You notice I didn't get a title in the program. I had the title. I just forgot to get it to my church secretary. At <laughs> any rate, the title is Remember, Proclaim, Give Thanks, and Fellowship. Remember, Proclaim, Give Thanks, and Fellowship. <clears throat> Back when I was a uh, student at Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois, I, on Sunday mornings I used to go down with a busload of fellas down to Madison Street in Chicago, uh, at that time known as Skid Row. Do you know where the name Skid Row comes from? Who said yes? Where does it come from? Surely, you're pretty sharp. <laughs> yeah, that used to be a logging road, and uh, they would put these skids on the road, and they would oftentimes grease them, and then they would slide the logs down into the Chicago River. And so it was called Skid Road, and gradually across the country in the various cities, it became known as Skid Road, R-O-W, where people who had, uh, had not overcome their drinking problem would end up being homeless and uh, oftentimes sleeping in the street or the alleys and in Skid Row in Chicago they had these what they call flop, flop houses and uh, a, a man could uh, for a couple of dollars could get one of these uh, eight by eight rooms and uh, he could flop for the night and uh, but uh, whenever I went down there, uh, and we were going to go down on Sunday morning because they couldn't buy any liquor after 12 o'clock in Chicago back then, and our thought was that at least they would be somewhat sober so that we could share Christ with them. And, uh, but they were always, and I say always, they were looking for a couple of dollars uh, to buy so a bottle of, of cheap wine. And I can remember offering to take them out for breakfast. And they said, oh, no, no, can't, can't you just give me a couple dollars? You know, and, uh, now, do you know what happens when you give a street drunk a bottle of very, very expensive wine? Do you know what happens? Yeah. They drink it as if it were the cheap stuff. 
They give absolutely no thought whatsoever to the treasure of a very expensive wine. Now, in a similar way, if we partake of the Lord's table without giving much thought to it, we too, like that dr drunk, totally miss the treasure of it. You see, taking Holy Communion is a very sacred activity if we approach it in the right way. It's like a sparkling diamond that has many sides or many facets to it. The most important facet is the facet that talks about remembering. In verse 24 of our text, the Apostle Paul tells us that after Jesus had given thanks for the bread, he broke it and he said to his disciples, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we come to our Lord's table to remember. We come to remember the cost, the cost of our salvation, the blood that our Lord shed on a cross so that our sins might be forgiven. You see, our, our Lord's, Lord's table, if you will, is, is the New Testament Passover. Its roots, however, were in the Old Testament Passover feast that focused on remembering the deliverance of the Jews from Egypt. The last 10 plagues that God used to break Pharaoh's stubborn heart was the killing of the firstborn sons of all Egyptian families. But God told the Jews that if they would brush the blood of the Passover lamb on the doorpost of their homes, that when the angel of death came by, he would pass over that home. And so in the New Testament, the blood of Jesus saves, saves us from the consequences of our sins, that is from what our Bibles call the second death that is from spiritual death, from eternal separation from God, if you will. As the Apostle Paul puts it, he says, the wages of our sin is death. That is eternal separation from God. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is eternal communion with God. And so, in other words, Jesus is the New Testament Passover lamb. If we brush the blood of Jesus, figuratively speaking, over our sins, then that second death will pass over us. Thus, as Christians, we speak of being covered by the blood of Jesus, of being passed over. And so first and foremost, we remember that Jesus shed his blood that we might have life, eternal life. Now the second fast proclaiming gets a little more complicated, so you've got to listen carefully here. The Apostle Paul in the 26th verse says to us, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so as we come to the Lord's table, we come as a means of proclaiming. But the question is, what are we proclaiming? Well, what we are proclaiming is that Christ has won, that his is the victory, that he has overcome the kingdom of darkness and that Satan and death have been defeated once and for all. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 through 19, this is a very controversial passage. Um, the Catholic Church has used it to teach uh, uh, purgatory. Uh, the Mormon Church has used it to teach baptism of the dead. Um, it uh, has also been used by some to teach uh, universal salvation. Um, however, none of those fit the context In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 through 19, Peter tells us that after Jesus died in his body, he was made alive in his spirit. 
And his spirit then did something very, very special and very exciting between Friday and Sunday morning, the time of his resurrection. By way of his spirit, he went and he made a proclamation. That is, he brought a message to the spirits in prison. Now, some older translations take that word for proclamation. It's the, the, the Greek word caruso. It can be translated either preached or proclaimed. And so some of the older translations, they, they use the word preach, that he went to preach to the spirits in prison. But many, including the new NIV, have changed that to the word proclaimed. For example, the new NIV, which used to use the word preached, now has changed it to made proclamation. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He, has put, he was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. And after being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits. Made proclamation. But then the question is, who are the imprisoned spirits? Well, in the New Testament, book of Jude, verse 6, we are told who they are. They are actually fallen angels. Uh, we read here in verse 6, And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, to, but abandoned their proper, proper dwelling, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains, for judgment on that great day. Now, these fallen angels are what we refer to as demons. Everyone always wonders, well, what is a demon? Well, a demon is a fallen angel. In Colossians 2.15, we are told that having disarmed the powers and the authorities, Jesus made a public spectacle of them, tri triumphing over them by the cross. And then we read in Ephesians 4.5 about that public spectacle. It says, Jesus ascended on high. When Jesus ascended on, ascended on high, he led captives in his train. That is, in Roman history, when uh, a general would go out and would conquer his enemy. He would then lead them back to the capital or the city and he'd have the enemies in his train following behind and they would be chained and uh, uh, they would be made a public spectacle of. Uh, and so in Ephesians 4, 8, we, we read, when Jesus ascended on high, he led, led captives in his tra train. And then in the next verse, Paul adds, what does he ascended mean except that he descended to the lower earthly regions. And so the second facet of our coming to the Lord's table has to do with making a proclamation of proclaiming. Proclaiming that Jesus has won, that he has defeated the powers of darkness, that he has overcome the evil one and the demon world, which was full of fallen angels. And there are other verses that support this in the book of Revelation and in other places in the Bible. And so we come to the Lord's table with the proclamation that death has been defeated, that the power of Satan has been defeated, that Christ has won. And that's the proclamation. Now a, a third facet of our coming to our Lord's table has to do with gratitude or giving thanks to God for what he has done. Uh, this is why in the Roman Catholic Church, the Lord's Table is often referred to as the Holy Eucharist. And the word, Greek word Eucharist comes from the Greek word that means to be grateful. So we come to our Lord's Table with a grateful heart. We come to show our gratitude to God for sending his Son as a sacrifice for our sins. And then the fourth facet, the one that I especially want to focus on this morning, has to do with what we call Holy Communion. The word communion has to do with oneness. It means being in harmony with God. It means being in harmony with one another. This past Memorial Day, we had a chicken barbecue feast and then we had a silent auction afterwards 
in our fellowship hall. And many of you were present. And what we had at this time was what we could call a time of holy communion. That is a time of harmony and oneness and unity together. As we ate, as we milled around waiting for the results of the silent auction, people shared in a beautiful time of, of talking and laughing together and just having this, uh, this oneness. It was a wonderful time of warmth and closeness. It fit our dictionary's definition of communion, or if you will, holy communion, in the sense of having oneness and harmony in God's family. In our Bibles, the word communion has its roots in the Greek word koinonia. I think Ken preached on that some time ago, and which in English means fellowship. And the word koinonia and our word communion really are synonymous terms. Koinonia was a very popular word in the early church. The first Christians put a lot of weight on fellowship with one another, or of having holy communion with one another, if you will. Sometimes it was referred to as the communion of the saints. And Luke tells us that the early church devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, that is to the koinonia, to the communion of the saints. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 13, Peter uses the word koinonia to describe the early church's communion in terms of suffering together. Rejoice, he says, since you are having fellowship in the sufferings of Christ. Since you are having oneness in the sufferings of Christ. Rejoice, or perhaps better yet, count it pure joy as you experience communion with Christ and his sufferings. The church that Peter is talking about in 1 Peter were undergoing tremendous persecution. And so... Peter wants to give them a, a word of hope. And so having communion with Christ as he suffered, proclaiming that Christ has won, that he has overcome the evil one, that he has overcome death and Satan. Now as we can see, communion above all else has to do with oneness, with harmony, with unity between brothers and sisters in Christ. And so what this means this morning is whether you experience communion or not, all depends on your relationship with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Is there a oneness with you? Is there harmony? Is there a closeness? Is there warmth? You see, holy communion that is pure and unadulterated with our Lord and with one another can only happen if there are no obstacles in the way. It can only happen if there's no separation, no hostility, no bitterness, no hard feelings between you and a brother or sister in Christ or between you and God. If there is a wall between you, that is if there's some hurt or some wrong or some sin that has not been confessed or forgiven, there has been some unkind word that has never been retracted. If there is some resentment that has never been resolved, then there really can be no true communion for you this morning until that wrong is confronted and made right. And this is why Jesus says to us in his Sermon on the Mount, he says, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar first Go and be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift. Now certainly you can outwardly partake in the Lord's table and nobody will know. Nobody will be the wiser. That is except you and God. You may look like you're having holy communion, but inwardly something very important will be missing. And that is the presence of God's love for your brother and sister in Christ. You will have, as our Bibles put it, a form of godliness, but one that is empty of God's presence. But worse than this, 
by partaking of the bread and the cup in this unworthy manner, you're putting yourself at spiritual risk. Whereas Paul tells us in our text this morning, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and against the blood of our Lord. Now the key words in this verse are the words in an unworthy manner. Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner. Now it's really important to understand that this is not talking about your being good enough in order to come to our Lord's table. The truth is, is none of us are good enough. We are people who sin. We don't sin all the time, but we are people who do sin from time to time. In the book of Proverbs, the author asks, he says, who can say I have kept my heart pure? I am clean and without sin. The reality is that none of us can say that. And so when Paul says to us in our text that whoever eats the bread and drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be, the, will be guilty of sinning against the body and against the blood of our Lord, he's not talking about an unworthy manner in the sense of having sin in our lives. But rather what he's talking about is the heart that we bring to our Lord's table. Does it have a hardness in it? Does it have unforgiveness in it? Does it have bitterness in it? That is, is it a heart that is holding a grudge against another brother or sister in Christ? Is it a heart that refuses to remove that obstacle that is separating them from one another and from God? You see, this is the real issue at our Lord's table that is being spoken of in our text this morning. And this was the issue with those in the Corinthian church. A few verses before the text that we read from this morning, Paul says to them, I hear that when you come together, there are divisions among you. And then he adds, it is not the Lord's supper you eat. Now, can you imagine what our chicken barbecue would have been like if there had been squabbling and bitterness between different groups within the church family? It certainly would not have been a time of Holy Communion. It certainly would not have been a time of proclaiming our Lord's victory over the evil one. And so as you can see, what Paul is talking about in our text this morning is the heart that we bring to the Lord's table. Is it a heart in which there is a deep love for one another? If it isn't, then there can be no Holy Communion for you this morning. This, above all else in this text, is what Paul wants us to grasp this morning. And this is why Paul says to us in the 28th verse, examine yourselves before you eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Let us pray. My gracious Father, I just want to thank you personally for, in this church family, I don't see any bitterness or resentment or hard feelings or unforgiveness. But then, I don't see all things like you do. And so we bring this message, even though it may sound like it's not relevant, but yet it's there. And it's a warning to us that we do not want to take, partake of the Lord's table in an unworthy manner, that is with a heart that is not right between ourselves and you and between our brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we ask you, Father, to speak to each one in just a very, very personal way and just uh, give your guidance. And so we leave this in your hands, letting your Holy Spirit do the work. And we give thanks for your word in Christ's name. Amen.